It looks as good from the back as it does from the front. So I bought a Revision B iMac Bondi Blue and I kind of want to talk about this machine a little bit more. The purpose of this video is to discuss the iMac G3's place in history as well as uh, what I thought of it when it was new when it first came out and what it meant to be a kid in 1998. So we're going to do a quick walk around of this machine and kind of take it all in. Most of you have seen an original iMac, at least uh, in print or on, uh, on the internet in photos. The original iMac was announced on May 6th of 1998 by the CEO of Apple, Steve Jobs. Why is that important? Well, Steve Jobs' team had only been in production for 11 months. They had only been together for 11 months and they had to save the company and they had to do it fast. The iMac was the first product the team had released as a sellable unit under the new design language that changed history. It was May 6th, 1998, and Steve Jobs got up in front of a group of investors and just plain fans and announced Apple's new direction, a, uh, a path in which the company was to take that would steer it clear of its existing path, which was essentially heading towards a brick wall at 150 miles an hour. Apple was in bad shape. They were the underdog. But worse than that, they were the underdog that was bound to fail. Apple was pleading for people to buy their products, and they would do anything necessary to make that happen. In order to make the Mac OS more appealing, they licensed the operating system to third-party manufacturers such as UMAX, Motorola, and Power Computing for the production of Apple clones or Macintosh clones. Now Steve Jobs, of course, had been fired in 1986. And we won't get too far into that history. That's well documented elsewhere. But Steve Jobs was offered a position with Apple to come back if he could right the ship. And he took the challenge and he took it and he ran with it. One of the first things Steve Jobs did was he fired nearly everybody. He fired anyone who mattered. And further than that, he killed off a couple of uh, product lines, one of them being the Macintosh clones. That was one of the first, course, uh, the first actions he took as CEO. He killed off all clones. It was to cease immediately. No more licensing of the Mac OS. You know, and it's kind of scary when you think about it. Apple was planning on licensing the OS to Windows PC manufacturers as like a Windows shell. Yuck. Gross. May not have been a shell, but they were planning on opening up the licensing of, uh, of Mac OS to basically anyone who wanted it. You could just go out and buy Mac OS for your Windows machine and you had a Mac, right? Fortunately, Steve Jobs, you know, talked them off, talked them down from that and, uh, built some new teams, some new developers, some new uh, industrial design engineers teams, or industrial design teams, marketing teams. He, he built his own, uh, you know, groups within Apple to bring the company back to solvency. The first product that was essentially the brainchild of this new direction was the iMac G3, shown here in Bondi Blue. The first iMac G3, because there were many, <laughs> was the Revision A, and that machine was actually in production for a fairly short period of time. Apple quickly realized that there were many mistakes in the machine's design and there were improvements to be made that had to be made for the machine to succeed, so they released the Revision B in October of 1998. What we have here is actually a revision B. Um, so getting back to the iMac, when Apple, when Steve Jobs and I believe it was Phil Schiller released the iMac in that conference, they billed it as a competitor 
to even the higher end consumer grade computers. In fact, I had to rewatch the conference uh, before making this video and I suggest you all pause my video right now and go watch it because it is worth seeing just for its historical relevance. In this conference, or uh, actually more of a, a presentation, Steve Jobs had placed two competing or two high-end Windows workstations, uh, consumer workstations. If I recall, they were Pentium 2, 233, and he had a Pentium 2 400 workstation uh, running head-to-head -head with the iMac, playing a sample demo video. And wouldn't you know it, both Windows workstations, unsurprisingly, failed miserably at this presentation. In fact, it was almost embarrassing. As a longtime PC user myself, seeing just how embarrassingly poor this video playback was, was actually kind of shocking to me. I didn't believe they were that bad. Well, anyway, you know, then again, the presentation is, of course, tailored to, um, you know, the IMAX hardware, which we'll get into in a little bit as to what it offered. So, not only did they benchmark the iMac in relation to its uh, PC peers, they also did the same thing with their new PowerBook line. Now, this I'm gonna I'm gonna get into the iMac's design at this point here. So the iMac was designed to be friendly, easy to use, affordable, and somewhat reliable. But reliability was not really one of the main topics of discussion during its announcement. The iMac was designed to be the uncomputer, the computer designed for the burgeoning internet age. In 1998, the market saturation of internet access in American households, the figures which I am too lazy to look up, weren't nearly what they are today. Today, everybody has access to the internet if they want it, but in 1998, they did not. I personally did not have internet access until 1997. And uh, for those of you who care, it was on a 486 Tandy 3100 desktop. The iMac was the computer for the new millennium. And it couldn't look like a beige, stodgy box. And I'm going to now show you, for those of you who don't watch my channel, a couple of examples of Apple's industrial design up to that point. The Apple IIgs of 1986. The Macintosh LC series of 1992, 93, and 94, 91, 92, 93. The 1985 Apple IIc. The 1991 Macintosh Classic. The 1994 Macintosh Performa. The 1998 iMac G3. Brother from another mother? I think not. Now, the iMac G3 was a completely new product from the ground up. Even the peripherals, the keyboard and mouse, were designed to be different from what preceded them. But most importantly, the iMac was the first consumer-based Mac since the Performa had been discontinued. The iMac was the computer for the classroom. It was the computer for the college student. Mom, dad, sister, brother. It was the computer for the home. It was the computer for the whole family. There were so many of these machines produced because it was so successful. But it wasn't without critics. The iMac was heavily criticized. Heavily criticized for its design, heavily criticized for some very unusual engineering gaffes. Um, for example, these keyboards were not that pleasant to use. They had shortened or, or, or narrowed function keys on top. They were a relatively unconventional layout. You had your help home page up and down keys above the numeric keypad. Um, it was a, it was an unusual keyboard. It had these tiny little arrow keys. Let me uh, move the camera so you can get a better look. 
I mean, it truly was an object of derision. Look at these arrow keys. Tiny little arrow keys, not even laptop sized. And getting used to it, see, keyboards are a highly personal item. It is the way you interface with the equipment. It is how you pour your thoughts out onto silicon. The keyboard is something that you are very, very intimate with, with your fingers. Hopefully, only your fingers. But what's even worse, <laughs> even worse, is this stupid hockey puck mouse. Now, the hockey puck mouse looks cool, and Steve Jobs in his presentation made a point to highlight just how awesome and, and forward-thinking this mouse really was. But it was anything but that. The mouse was designed not to be usable, but to be different. This mouse, for all intents and purposes, is the worst mouse, the most hated mouse ever designed, and it wouldn't be an original iMac G3 without it. Even I, to this, to this day, as I was setting this Mac up for this video, even I found it frustrating, and I've been using these machines forever. Now, the thing is, Unless you're, unless you have some invisible force field that prevents the mouse from turning all around like that, it's so frustrating to use because if you rotate it, so this is how you're supposed to grab the mouse like this. Now, when you grab the mouse like that, you're not feeling the cord in back. So you're 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 reaching over, you grab the mouse, you go to use it. Right now, the cursor is moving up and down and now it's moving sideways because of how I have, well, that's an exaggeration, but it's not uncommon that people would actually, and you can't feel the difference. You, there's no, there's no feel. There's no, there's no way for you to know what direction the mouse is, is turning unless you feel around for the cord. God forbid they made a wireless version of this, which they never did, but could you imagine? Um, now, in order to solve that problem, they added a small divot to the button here, but that didn't come until um, later in the production cycle when they did that. Another neat little fun fact while we're here, uh, these little colored um, pieces on the mouse here, or these, uh, these little, little side pieces, they actually snap on and off. You can change the color of the mouse. You can even mix it up a little bit uh, by snapping these off and putting it back on again. Now, for reference, or for the record anyway, this mouse was manufactured by Logitech. And a couple, and I, saw, I talked about this in a previous video, um, but some of the differences between this one and the later production version, aside from the little divot here, the color of this hologram in later production models became a steel blue versus a more of a Bondi blue. And the mouse ball on this one is the original blue and white later versions of this mouse had um, gray and white. And I think at some point they went to a solid color. This mouse, by the way, was replaced by the Mac or the Apple Pro mouse, which uh, was their first optical mouse. And it was, interestingly enough, uh, the mouse that came out after this was in production in the same basic shape um, up until approximately, actually, no, I think they made them up until just a couple of years ago, in fact. Uh, in modified form, of course, but the mouse hadn't changed shape. They got it right, they left it alone. This was a mistake. So, moving on. The design of the computer was revolutionary in comparison to its peers. Now, one of the things I want to point out, which is why this Mac was, was so successful, whenever an object, whenever a product is successful, it influences the products of other companies. After the iMac was released, PC manufacturers realized very quickly that their computers were hideous. In fact, a reference that Steve Jobs made during his presentation was that PCs are just absolutely hideous. And the advertisements um, that aired for the original iMac, and I suggest you watch some of them, especially there, there's one ad that stars a, a relatively famous actor. He was more famous... Uh, for his role as Ichabod Crane in um, a movie he did, Sleepy Hollow. It was in the early 1980s. He also had a minor role in a science fiction movie um, that had to do with dinosaurs or, or reptiles. Or, I forget which. 
Um, his name is Jeff. Anyway, he did a, uh, a version of the iMac ad that talked about the simplicity of setting up the iMac. And there was an extended run commercial that was released uh, that featured a child and a college student, no, a 26 year old adult, uh, setting up a Mac and a PC. The adult was setting up a, uh, I believe it was a, uh, an HP desktop PC, and the child was setting up the iMac G3. And just go ahead and watch it. I won't spoil it for you, but the iMac wins in that, in that commercial, not surprisingly. But what Apple really focused on with this machine in marketing it to consumers and schools alike is its compact design, its ease of setup, its ease of use, um, and the fact that you only needed to plug in a power cord, a phone cord, and the keyboard, and you're off and running. And in typical Apple fashion, when you start up a new Mac, you're not met with an onslaught of license agreements, software trials, and just plain glut that takes away at the enjoyment of setting up a new machine. The iMac is essentially ready to go out of the box. You turn it on and you're off and running. It's so simple. A problem that even PC manufacturers to this day can't seem to figure out. But that's just how it is. Now let's talk about what most of the iMac's critics were talking about. Now the price really wasn't an issue for this machine. It sold new for around $1,300, which the price had later been dropped a little bit. You compare that to a price of a computer today, and it really isn't all that bad. Remember, computers used to cost more, not less. Computers are one of those commodities that, is actually, that have actually generally gone down in price. So when you bought an iMac for $1,300, it compared pretty well you know, to a Windows machine that would have cost around $2,000 um, in terms of what you get in value for dollar. It was a, it was a bargain. But where the critics really got this machine Actually, there, there are a couple of issues, and one of them is unsurprising considering its manufacturer, but expandability. The iMac had very limited expandability. In fact, it almost had none. As far as I understand, the manufacturer, Apple, never condoned hard drive upgrades, but they were possible. You can upgrade the hard drive in one of these relatively easily. Um, you'll want to find an older 20 gigabyte or smaller drive, and you'll have to partition it um, with a first partition of less than about four gigabytes. Four gigabytes is, I think, the ceiling, as it does run classic OS. In this case, I'm running Mac OS 851 by choice, by the way. But it will run Mac OS 10.3.9, as far as I'm concerned. Nevertheless, hard drive upgrades are possible, and RAM upgrades are possible. Now, the initial revision A iMac had a RAM ceiling of just 128 gigabytes, whereas the revision B that we have here goes up to 768 megabytes, according to lowendmac.com, which seems a little higher than I expected. But anyway, I'll just read you the excerpt right from their website. Um, 32 megabytes was standard on these machines, expandable to 768 using two DIMM sockets, use the same SD RAM so DIMMs as the PowerBook G3. Top DIMM accepts two inch DIMM, bottom socket takes one and a half inch. So I do recall that there were some space restrictions for memory modules on these. All tray loading iMacs work with modules up to 128 megabytes. Okay, so I'm a little confused as to that, but all right. With a 512 megabyte module and a low profile 256, it's theoretically possible that these iMacs could support 768 megs of RAM. And I can confirm now that the processor is a 233 megahertz PowerPC 750 with a 66 megahertz bus. Now, one of the differences between the revision A and B is that the revision A uh, can, I believe, only support up to Apparently the revision A supports the same 768 megs, which I did not know. Um, but one of the key differences between the revision A and B, other than uh, hardware and firmware revisions, there was a or, um, behind the scenes type things. The revision A ships with two megabytes of video RAM. It can be upgraded 
but it's still a, a compromise either way because the graphics chip is a little bit slower or a little bit uh, less advanced than the revision B. Um, now the other consideration is the revision A um, being the first iMac, absolutely the first model, uh, has a little bit more collector value, I think, than the Revision B. But if you intend to actually use the machine, the Revision B is the way to go, or even a Revision C, if you're not a purist, and you don't mind not having the, uh, the infrared window. So the original iMac, uh, being designed for the educational market, does in fact have an infrared window in the front. Very few desktops have ever had that, for that feature, um, at least usable as a file transfer option. And the reason for that was the original uh, eMage supports um, infrared communications. At least that's what I recall from, from memory. The headphone jack, uh, there are two headphone jacks on the front and one audio output jack on the side. The headphone jacks is another um, homage to the machine's educational target audience. It's very common, at least back then in American schools, to have more than one student sitting in front of a computer, and if they were doing an activity that required sound, they would both be wearing headsets. Um, otherwise, you don't typically see desktop computers with dual headphone jacks. And in later versions, especially the slot loaders, the dual headphone jacks were deleted uh, in exchange for just a single audio output jack. Upon the IMAX release, it was heavily criticized for its keyboard, its mouse, and its unique shape and color options. Not many people took the machine seriously, and no one ever really thought it would save Apple. Um, in fact, if you went back in time and you told the detractors of the IMAX that this company would eventually overtake Microsoft and put many PC manufacturers out of business and become the number one cell phone manufacturer in the world, or damn close to it, and have enough uh, pro enough cash on hand to buy a small country, they would laugh at you. In fact, Apple was this machine was expected to fail along with the iPod and of course the iBook um, because they were so radically different from the norm. But sometimes you have to blow up what is normal to become the new normal. It's it's really f freaky that way. But one of the reasons it was so detracted or so so derised, uh, you know what I'm saying, was because it had no means of saving to a portable media format. For example, back in 1998, floppy disks were still fairly commonplace. In fact, they were very commonplace. Um, they were one of the only affordable document storage methods around. Thumb drives hadn't come to the scene yet, and external hard drives weren't even thought of, at least not in the sense that we think of them. External hard drives are more commonly used on machines equipped with SCSI, SCSI uh, adapters, like most Apple products. Which reminds me, this machine does not have a SCSI port. There is no FireWire, naturally. That didn't come into later models, but um, no SCSI. It does support netbooting, which is kind of cool, but you know, that's mainly for imaging the machine across a network. But, you know, there are um, very few I.O. ports on this machine. It has just two uh, version 1 USB ports. It has, you know, a microphone and a headphone jack, and that's basically it. It does have Ethernet, which, again, ties into Apple's forward thinking. They were really thinking ahead of their time. Their thought was that you would transfer files over the network or through email over a dial-up connection or other file sharing services, which did exist at the time. Remember 50megs.com? Yeah, free 50 megabytes online. Wow. And we thought that was huge space. That was a lot of space. Anyway, but that's all right, because third-party manufacturers jumped at that opportunity and they released iMac colored external floppy disk drives. Now, this is a uh, Imation Super Disk. This did come in other colors other than Bondi Blue. Uh, but this is one of the, if you are looking at buying an external drive for your iMac, I highly recommend the Super Disk. Uh, because it is, being a Super Drive, it supports the LS120 format, which was so successful 
I'm just kidding. It wasn't. But they are nice. They're fast, and they're you can store a lot of data on them. Good alternative to a to a, a zip disk. The LS120 discs were often used on um, on Windows machines as well. So, you know, you can still transfer files between Windows and Mac if you can find a good working external. Um, USB super disk drive for your PC. In fact, I think this will work with Windows in fact. Anyway, it even had a color-coded connector on the back, which is kind of nice. Nice and heavy, rugged little drive these were. These were. You also have the option of using zip disks. Uh, USB zip drives were very common and very popular back then um, for transferring files. But there was no provision for a CD burner until the slot load model came out, and uh, that's when Apple started installing what they called their super drives on the uh, portable and the desktop products. So let's talk about the iMac's place in history. So we've established that the iMac was a machine that helped usher in a whole new era of industrial design as it pertained to consumer and business office products. I'm going to talk to you about my experience as a 14 year old in 1998. In 1998, we were still, the pop culture scene was, was, was different, it was unique because it was kind of like a rebirth of the 1960s. Austin Powers, which came out in 1997, brought in a whole new wave of nostalgic uh, design and cultural references. Jinko jeans, which were very popular when I was a kid. I never owned a pair. I was that weird kid who dressed in, you know, just regular jeans and plain t-shirts. That was how I dressed. Um, I never wore anything from my generation in terms of clothing, clothing stuff. I still don't. I wear cheap button-down shirts and black or blue jeans but that's just me but all my friends they were walking to school with $80 bell-bottom jeans from Jinko <laughs> they were very popular but that was a design element from the uh, that was a, cl a clothing uh, design from the 60s that was kind of uh, caricaturized and and just exaggerated for a new generation jolt soda not jolt um, surge surge soda uh, was very popular back then. I believe it came out in the late 90s. Let's see. Now, the music that we listened to back then often contained 1960s uh, rock elements. Two songs that I'm going to uh, mention, uh, Walking on the Sun by Smash Mouth and um, Praise You by Fatboy Slim. Yeah, there's a good one. If you listen to those two songs, you're going to hear some uh, rhythms and, and just techniques that kind of harken back to the 1960s and 70s. And that's where the iMac comes in. The iMac was released at a time when people were buying inflatable furniture for their bedrooms. A time I had an inflatable armchair in my bedroom and an ottoman. It was so cool. <laughs> people were heavily into retro designs, colors, you know, it was a new, it was, it was like a, like a rebirth of, of some of what preceded my generation. Volkswagen released their new Beetle, which uh, was another, again, 1960s uh, pop culture icon come to life again. And you've got to think about, you know, this is what people were looking at buying. They're buying Volkswagen Beetles and inflatable furniture, Jinko jeans and and floral patterns and uh, uh, you know, curtains and such. They were bringing back that that rounded, you know, limited. You know, a lot of the consumer electronics from that time period um, were starting to to round off in general. You know, televisions, coffee makers, the straight lines of the '90s were kind of passe by this point. So Apple took all that into consideration and kind of blended it into a, basically an electronic gumdrop, if you will. And they did a fantastic job of really capturing the pop culture of the time and the designs and styles of the time. And of course, as I said earlier, 
you know, when Apple came out with this machine, it really influenced the design of other computer manufacturers, but in a hilariously funny way. E-Machines is a, is a great example, and they were sued for this. E-Machines released a, um, a look-alike of the iMac, but it was, a, it was almost as if someone described it over the phone and the designer was penning it from that descriptive conversation. It was so hilariously weird. Um, but it was such a clear ripoff of the iMac, and they were very quickly sold, and that machine was pulled from the market almost as quickly as it was released. If you can find an eMachines E1, it is worth more than an iMac because of its rarity, but not built as well. And, and if you find a working one, I would be surprised. Um, Compaq. Uh, started releasing their Presario desktops with exchangeable color faceplates. They were translucent color uh, covers that would cover the lower quarter or so of the of the uh, computer's tower. Actually, I think they were bigger than that. I think it was in an entire bezel. You could buy in uh, in in. I think they came in blue and red and orange and possibly even green. Um, HP started using translucent plastics, like a smoked gray plastic, on their uh, pavilion desktops around that time. Uh, but the Apple did. You can see influences of Apple's design, especially in the monitors that were released after the iMac. Um, and a lot of them had uh, just some, some pretty uh, bizarre styling elements that definitely harken back to the iMac's design. Imitation is a form of flattery, and the Apple iMac was imitated in a lot of other products. I remember my parents, or maybe my mom bought this for me. It was a like a little um, desktop cal a calculator, a calendar, and it had a thermometer. Neat little, little. it looked like a little iMac. It looked like a little, tiny little iMac, and it was even the same color as the iMac. Had a little tiny mouse that would you could you could press it and it it like turn the light on or something like that. It was it was a neat little neat little gadget and it didn't last very long. It was, you know Chinese junk whatever. Um, I remember other products like desktop accessories being made to resemble the iMac. HP and this is a funny one because uh, all right. So one of the things Steve Jobs killed off from Apple was the or. The entire printer division was killed off as soon as Steve took or took back the, the company. Um, so no more style writers, no more laser writers. They were now history. And companies like Epson realized that there was a market for an Apple-compatible printer. So they started releasing printers under the uh, style or Stylus 700i series, I believe they were called. And they came in different colors, if I remember. Uh, I know they definitely came in Bondi Blue or something similar to that. Now, HP, in, in a weird... Remember, we're talking about HP and Compaq and other manufacturers imitating Apple in their designs. HP released a printer under a special... Or under a, um, a sub-brand called Apollo. And it was designed a little bit after the iMac. It had the same rounded shape very rounded no no not a straight edge on this printer and it was an aquamarine blue translucent um cover that would like the accent covers were all translucent blue <coughs> but strangely enough it was not apple compatible i find that bizarre i've seen these printers for sale new in box for like 20 bucks um but i never thought to buy one I'm going to talk about my own experience with the iMac. Let's fire this thing up. I figure it should be running for a little bit during the video. We'll let it run, let it, let it uh, show what it's got. And I'll talk about what I thought about the iMac when it first came out. So, I think I was in, and I was in um, possibly 7th or 8th grade. I was in music class. And our music teacher had bought one of these new iMacs. Uh, it was in the um, summer of 1998 that he bought it. And he brought it to school to kind of show it off. And he was a Mac, we, he, was a, he was definitely a Mac, a Mac fanatic. Um, he was one of the few people that kept stuck with Mac 
through thick and thin. And he um, bought himself a new iMac. He paid like 1300 for it. And he brought it to class. And uh, before class started, we kind of gathered around it because we heard about these new machines. We just hadn't ever seen one. And we all had our things to say. We were 14-year-old kids, and we're like, you know, number one, it's ugly. Number two, it's flimsy. Like, check out the CD drive, for example. The early tray loaders were a very flimsy plastic. And you can see that, you know, we were like, you know, this is, this is crap. What is Apple thinking? This is flimsy. This is, you know, we had nothing good to say at all. We're looking at the keyboard and we're flexing it. We're like, wow, this is cheap. And compared to keyboards of that time period, this was really a low, uh, this is a, a low bar for Apple. Um, I mean, in hindsight, I think we were pretty wrong. I mean, this is not a bad keyboard and you can get used to its unusual layout. But when you're just looking at a machine that you either don't own or have no intention of purchasing and you're trying to find something wrong with it, you're going to. The mouse was another one. I mean, what is with this mouse? You know, as we covered earlier in this video, the mouse is the worst mouse ever made. Well, we aired our frustrations with our music teacher and he said, just get to your desks, we got work to do. But um, he obviously didn't like hearing, you know, his entire class making fun of his new computer. Naturally, I mean, nobody wants to hear that they just bought a lemon, but was it really a lemon? No, it wasn't. Again, this machine did eventually usher in a whole new way of looking at what a computer should be, what it should look like, and how it should work. Um, and again, the flack of a floppy drive, that was a simple third-party solution. And uh, several manufacturers, including Imation, stepped up to the plate and solved that problem. And very well, I might add. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever tested that drive to see if it even works. I think I'm going to do that right now. Take a floppy disk here. This is a, a modern uh, 1.44 meg disk. Let's see. Let's see if this thing even works. I'm kind of curious. Yeah, this, it, it mounted the disk. Now, another thing that's cool about these Imation drives is <laughs> keeping up with Apple's. Um, with Apple's legacy. Auto eject. I believe that is actually a, um, that almost sounds like an Omron eject motor from a Sony drive. I don't know who made this drive exactly, but it sounds like a Sony to me. I don't know what you guys think. It sounds like a typical Sony drive. It really does. Although the stepper motor that drives the, uh, the head rack doesn't sound the same, but they erase the disc. Mac. Platinum sound scheme, by the way. You can hear that. Talk about ASMR. The, uh, the platinum sound scheme definitely triggers that ASMR reaction in some people. It's formatting a disc for me right now. <laughs> so let's talk turkey what is it worth what are these iMacs really worth and how collectible are they well the 20th anniversary just passed and the official release anniversary is upcoming I believe it was August 15th of 1998 so that would make it August 15th of 2018 that was the release date where you could actually buy one of these suckers so the thing is what an iMac is worth depends on a lot of factors. It depends on who's looking, when they're looking, and what they're looking for in terms of, you know, color options or even revision level. So the revision A's aren't entirely that valuable. They're a very niche collector item. The revision A's are more desirable for people who are looking for the original launch model. The revision A is not one that I would buy to use for any reason. I would, I would get it running, restore it, restore the hard drive to its factory image, and just leave it. 
on a shelf. Take the battery out so it doesn't leak and just preserve it. Um, but the Revision Bs, I find them more appealing because they're just that much more functional. You've got more, more video RAM and you have a higher memory ceiling. You also have um, some hardware glitches worked out of, out of them as well. Now, the Revision C came in a wider range of colors as far as I, rem as I recall. And some people might want one in a particular color because it fits the decor in their, in their home. And that's what bring, that, that's, let's, let's get to that for a second. Now the iMac does appeal to a wider range of collectors uh, when compared to say an Apple 2GS or a Macintosh Classic because the Apple or the iMac would look great in a, in a postmodern decor um, in a you know in a, um, in, a, in a in a loft apartment or in an office setting I mean it would look great as just a decorative piece so you have people who buy them just for that reason and that reason alone and most of those people are more than likely going to buy up the um, the less functional versions the ones that have you know condition issues and we'll get into those in a second Slot loader IMAX, like I said, the, the very tail end of the slot loaders, the Dalmatians, the Snow Whites, and the Flower Powers, those are going to command a little bit of a higher price. And I, I couldn't tell you what price that would be because it does seem to change, you know, based on the season and the economy. So if you're looking to buy an iMac, I would say a fair price has to commensurate with condition. Look at what they're selling for on eBay at that moment. The prices will go up as they get older. Um, that is a given and that's that's just how things are. Right now is a good time to buy. They're fairly inexpensive and uh, they're fairly plentiful. There are quite a few still out there and uh, not for a lot of money. Um, just understand that they are a very limited machine. They have four gigabytes of hard disk space. Upgradable of course but you'll still have to replace that drive. Now on the re on the revision A's, B's, and C's, it's a very easy thing to do. Um, in fact, even the uh, even the slot loaders aren't that hard to replace. I've done quite a few myself um, back when I was servicing them on a regular basis. So now we should talk about condition. If you're looking to buy one of these iMacs, what are you looking for? What are you avoiding? Well, CRT chassis like this um, tend to develop problems as they age, whether they're used or not. And that can affect um, the visual quality of the image. This one here, I bought this one, no questions asked, because it was pretty crystal clear. I don't see much blurring of the image, especially as it warms up. Uh, when it's dirt, when it's dead cold, it's, it's pretty sharp too. CRTs will often, as they age, they'll begin to get blurry, slightly blurry, especially when they're cold. This one didn't seem to have that problem. Um, also, you can listen carefully to a, you want, you want to avoid one that has a high-pitched whistle or a whine or a buzzing sound, whether it's powered on or off. When they're powered off and they make a whistling sound, well, that's a problem with the internal power supply. If it happens with the CRT on and running, and that's a problem, I believe, usually with the yoke, the deflection yoke. I think there's a problem with the deflection yoke, but those issues can all be repaired, but that's where we get into some problems because these iMacs aren't that serviceable. So if you're looking at an iMac, it's important. The CRT condition is the utmost importance if you are looking to use the machine as a, as a novelty item or if you plan on displaying it running because the CRT is the, the area you're going to have the most problems. Now fortunately with the IMAX revisions A, B, and C, they have a cooling fan that helps to circulate air through the, uh, the upper chassis or the high voltage side. Um, it helps keep things uh, from overheating and drifting in value. And it's that value drift in capacitors and resistors that gives older CRTs problems. Value drift meaning that that you know one k resistor might either go up or down in value, or those capacitors might develop ESR equivalent series resistance. What happens when 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 those when those components begin to fail, the image quality deteriorates drastically if if it still works at all, and it's a challenge to repair. And I wouldn't recommend someone without an, a, a background in electronics repair and service 
try to attempt repairs themselves because it can expose you to lethal voltages. In fact, if you go on to the forums, every other post is, you know, don't do this because you'll kill yourself. Well, that's not always true, but it's a good guideline to, you know, I don't recommend cracking these open. But again, there's a unique problem with these IMAX as they get older, and that's the plastics begin to become brittle. So having to get into the CRT chassis to recap the analog, replace all the capacitors or, or resistors or what have you on the analog board can be destructive because you now, you, now you have to remove these plastics which are often clipped together, and those clips are gonna break. And the biggest problem, and I'm gonna take the camera off the tripod, there are screw caps here, here, yeah, just these two. When you take these off, because you have to get the to get the back cover off, you've got to remove the front bezel first. When you remove the bezel, if the clips don't break off, you're lucky. But you've got to remove these caps, and these you have to pry off gently with a black stick, and they will shatter like glass, I promise. And then you're going to start removing these screws, which are um, mounted to this plastic, um, I guess you'd call it a cowling, and this is made out of a plastic that gets very, very brittle over time, and as you start to remove those screws, there's a possibility that they will actually cause the plastic to shatter as you're removing them, or even putting them back together again. There are some people that, that actually contacted me and said they've done this with success, but I'm telling you from experience that that success is pretty rare. So the idea is you want to find one with a good, solid image with no geometric problems. In other words, avoid one that has been, has been pin cushioning. Um, <clears throat> and little, 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 quick, little quick tip there. So yes, you can adjust the geometry of the image from the control panel on these without tearing them apart. Very easy to do. The problem is if somebody is selling you one and it's pin cushioned to hell and they overcompensate for it, as the machine gets older, you won't have any more adjustment left, and you'll have to crack it open, and you'll have to address the, the cause. Now, one way to tell is to pull the PRAM battery out. Ask them if they'll let you pull the uh, motherboard out. Take the battery out. Wait a few seconds, or do a zap the PRAM. Um, command option PR. Look it up. I don't remember what the command is, but if you do that, it'll reset it to defaults and you'll see what the factory default settings are and if the screen is way off adjustment then you'll know there's a problem there. Um, this one here it actually came with a dead clock battery so I, uh, I pulled it out put a new one in but when I fired it up the screen came up absolutely perfect. If it comes up dim there's another issue. Uh, if, the, if the CRT is, is extremely dim even when the settings are you know fairly high You've, you've got a problem there. It may not be a bad CRT, but it could be simply uh, failing uh, driver circuitry in the analog board, all of which is repairable if you're extremely careful and you know what you're doing. And of course, these Macs contain hard disk drives, IDE drives to be exact, usually under 10 gigabytes. I think the largest was a 20, gig, 20 gigabyte drive in the later or the last slot loader models. Um, by the way, the slot loaders and the Rev, Rev ABCs, the originals, are two completely different machines. There's not really one part except maybe the CRT that can be um, swapped over. They're totally different machines, um, and they're built a little bit less robustly. The slot loader IMAX are going to have... Now, when I say slot loader, I mean there's a, a slot in the uh, CD drive. Those machines are going to have extremely brittle um, plastics. Those, are, those seem to be even more brittle than the Rev A's, B's, and C's, but they also have a unique flaw in that they have no cooling fan. Steve Jobs fought tooth and nail to get the engineers to remove the cooling fans from their machines, and the result was pretty disastrous because those particular ones, the slot loader models, um, they run hotter, and they also have a shorter life. Because of all that heat, 
the value drift in the um, in the circuitry in the analog board is even more drastic. They also have a, f a higher failure rate of hard disk drives uh, because the drives contribute to that heat, and they don't like to be run under high high heat situations. This is all from experience. I did service a fleet of these um, slot load IMAX, and I found them to be comically unreliable. But anyway. So this is just a couple of things to look out for. Now you can replace the hard drives. Um, you can still get, you know, fairly good IDE drives for relatively cheap money today, uh, but that won't always be true. And another word of caution: when you do put an IDE drive in there, you want to make sure that it's formatted uh, or partitioned correctly. You want the first partition to be under eight gigs. The second partition can be bigger than that, but you want to stick with smaller partitions, especially for the system drive because it will become corrupt due to a fault with, um, with, that, with the uh, file system. As I mentioned uh, a little while ago, the PRAM battery uh, should be replaced on any iMac like this because, and they all use the same battery, they're going to use one of these. Um, so when you get one of these, the first thing you should do is swap out this battery. It's easy to do. You just got to pull the motherboard and drive sled out, which is held in by like three screws. And you're going to find this battery to be uh, right on the top of the motherboard. It's in a little battery holder. And uh, this is a, um, a 14250, SAFT LS14250. It's a 3.6 volt battery. Um, it's a lithium battery, and they shouldn't leak that badly, but some users have reported that they've leaked so badly that they've destroyed the motherboard. Interestingly enough, this is basically the same battery that was used in the um, starting the Apple 2GS line back in the uh, early 80s, mid 80s. But those batteries should be swapped out and that's going to save your uh, your clock settings but it also preserves your screen geometry correction, your um, brightness, contrast, um, and a couple of other system settings are stored uh, in the in the PRAM programmable read-only memory. So these machines are totally collectible, but they do have their flaws, and I hope I, I, I outline most of them. There are more flaws, and they vary by from model to model. So make sure that before you buy one, you research what that model is known for, and if it's preventable or even repairable. Like I said, I bought this one because of its condition and the previous owner's story seemed to check out. So it had a nice life. It wasn't used in a school. And again, oh, I, and I mentioned this way back in the early parts of this video, avoid educational models because I'm telling you right now, they, they, they get beaten and used and abused so much. Unless you find one that was used in, say, the principal's office or some place where it didn't receive regular and daily abuse, from the student population. And those machines do exist, but all the ones that I maintained and serviced were, I wouldn't take any of them home and preserve any of them because they all had high mileage, high hours, and because uh, they were run all day long, never shut off for, for days and weeks on end. No, that's, that's the serious truth. But, um,. The other thing you want to make sure of is if you're buying a slot loader, test out the CD drive because often they fail because of the plastic um, guides that the disc rides against. Those guides were glued in place and that adhesive tends to disintegrate and that stuff gets jammed into the rollers and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's terminal, but it's a lot of fun to deal with. All right, I think that's enough for now. Um, if you guys have any questions or comments or wish to uh, correct me on some things, feel free. Um, comments are open. Have a great day.